Hey guys, um, this is the first part of a new After Realm story that I'm writing and drawing. Uh, its tentative name is just Medusa, and it's sort of a well, it is, it's a retelling of the Medusa story with, uh, with our characters from the After Realm. I uh, debated a bunch of different ways to record this, so I'm just going to do whatever. I, I wanted to kind of record the whole process from the beginning to end, but sometimes it's just difficult to be able to record what I'm drawing or working just because of life circumstances. Um, a lot of which is I work on the couch while I'm watching television. Um, so anyway, uh, unfortunately I didn't record the penciling section of this, but this is basically what it is. Which is uh, just, just regular 8.5 by 11 sheets of paper. And then I just sketched out the layouts from uh, my script. Um, I just decided to scan it right in. In my mind's eye, I wanted to go over all of this with pen. Um, a lot of times, the next step from this will be a... Um, I'll take a ballpoint pen or a Pigma Micron and work out all the details and the, the shapes. <clears throat> but this time... Just for the sake of time and wanting to record the process uh, in an efficient way, just moving forward. Um, so here we are. Here's the first page. Um, we are at a museum. I, uh, in my mind's eye, this first shot here was going to be a much larger, wider shot of the museum room. So it felt clear that I didn't need an exterior shot of the museum. But then I added these two panels here, which is the um, Una's interdimensional doorway being drawn and open up. And it just ate up too much space. And then the way I set this up, because I felt like we should have a relatively good, clear shot of them as they first appeared, um, it made the establishment of the, the space much smaller. So. Um, as I cropped this page together down, I realized my I was eyeballing it, and I always leave extra space up here so I can move panels around, especially for dialogue. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a, a, an exterior establishing shot here. Um, so I'm going to create another layer, and I'm going to lay down. I've also decided I'm going to ink all of this digi digitally as well, just for the sake of time. Um, so now I'm going to create my panels, and the way I do this is I use this square selecting tool, and I set it here so that it's subtracting. So that means every time I put a line through this, the selected area will be opened up like this. And we're leaving a panel, uh, a space up here. We're going to be able to see a museum shot and. That'll be our exterior establishment that this is a museum. <clears throat> if you watched some of the previous videos for this, you'll have heard me complaining that I had COVID pretty bad for about three weeks, both Taki and I. It was a rough ride, and afterwards we continued to be sick. I'm still fighting something off, um, so I'm still not 100%. Um, okay, so now I'm going to just outline this. Um, make sure I'm using black one. Because I'm not feeling 100%, I might not be communicating super clearly or um, in ways that make sense all the time. So have some patience. So I didn't sketch this out before, so I'm going to just do a very loose sketch that I will figure out later. Museum. <laughs> and this gives me a sense that this museum is in perspective. They usually have columns on them and stuff. This isn't officially the New York Met or any specific museum. Um, but I'm allowing it to just kind of feel like those. <coughs> and I'll put the title here. Even though I think I'm probably actually create a whole um, credits wall cover, basically. Um, 
So maybe I won't have the title on here. I'll, I'll kind of figure that out near the end. It's one of the fun parts about you know creating stuff for yourself is uh, everything is valuable as you go along. Um, I'm going to go right into black spotting. So basically, I mean, I see most of it in my head. Um, uh, this will be a combination of spotting blacks and tightening up bits and pieces so I can go right into the inking. So I've created another layer here over my pencils. I'm going to bump the opacity way down. Um, grab myself a larger brush size here. Make sure to stable adjacent down so that I can really move um, as I walk through this thing. I want to show there's a different setting back here, so um, well, I'll figure it out later. Maybe there'll be trees or something like that. Uh, and I'm just going to lay down the sh the shadows and the characters here. I'm not being exact. I'm just kind of blocking out my shapes. So what I'm doing here is I'm creating basically a white area that kind of goes through the center. So we're gonna hopefully that'll make the eye follow from here down this way. You just move your eye across the page, you know. Some of these will be super obvious to me. Like there's a broken statue here in the foreground. The background just needs to be black. I don't need any real detail back here. These are like vending machines and there's like a hallway. And it's going to be mostly in shadow. One of the things that I like about laying out on 11, 8.5 by 11 is because I'm working digitally, if I draw it small originally and I know the face it's going to be tough to get detail in there and digitally I'll end up going in there and just working it too much with fine fine brush details and um, the line work gets too small and uh, it becomes unnecessary detail so by working like this I can realize oh you know what I'm probably I won't really need any face here I just need her shapes um, and that'll prevent me when I'm inking to go in there and just do too many details Some foreground elements here. I wanted to get him bigger or closer. There's a note here you can't see. You can barely see this closer. <clears throat> Make him larger. That's one of the fun things about working digitally. It's easy to fix things. Um, Just thinking about what kind of shading in here. I don't need anything literal, so all I want is kind of a framing device. Just keep the eye coming straight down here. Or actually, what I should do is that your eye is going to be over here from this panel. So in order to just make it a smoother transition and to guide the eye, I'm going to make the shadow come down like this. It's almost like a spotlight from that panel to this panel. This is all on another layer, so obviously I can make it super light. I'm trying to think what would be good here. So her hair is going to be open and red. I'll just kind of do the same thing. There's some light black spotting here, big shapes. Um, some details I'll probably want more of. Like her hand as I go in here inking. So I'm going to turn this over. Let's go flip horizontal. 
in flipping horizontal will help you see the figure work a little bit better, where it's wonky, where it might need some fixing. Um, things call out to be stronger. So I'm going to create another layer here over the art, or the, my sketches outlines. Uh, let's get in and there's a lot of imperfections here. I don't feel like there's too much that I need to fix. Um, I am going to oops, make this pretty small. I'm going to tighten up her face because faces are important. story is kind of dark, not too dark, but it's a little dark, so the beginning of this I'm making sure there's a certain amount of joy, you know, um, Puka is always fun and he's always having fun. Um, so when Una first shows up here, I want to make sure that she's not like looking around for doom and gloom immediately, you know, and this gives her character contrast for what happens later in the story. Again, none of this needs to be perfect. It's just, just to help me when I go right into inks. I can see all of this pretty clearly. Man, it's crazy. I've just been feeling sick one way or the other <laughs> since Thanksgiving. And it's almost New Year's now. Whatever's going on out there, it's just, there's a lot of it. I'm also giving Una uh, a really different look for this story because I want to um, imply that, you know, she's, she's, they're traveling around and they're having different adventures and going to different places. So um, she's going to get to have different shirts from different time periods and without ever spelling it out. Hopefully it says something about where they've been and who they are. She's wearing an I Love New York shirt. I have to draw this backwards because I flipped it. All right, that's good enough. I'm trying to do some really different stuff with this. When I, when I first began the After Realm, I wanted to be hardcore high fantasy. Um, and just over the years, as time went by, I started to really find what the story truly was. Um, and it's, it's actually an inverted high fantasy. Um, I don't want to say too much about it because it's still early on for these stories. But um, sometimes it can take a while to really find your, your, your voice with a story or a concept. Um, and this has been on a little bit of a journey itself. Uh, we got five issues out through Kickstarter. Um, and now after the Kickstarter, Kickstarter is a lot of work, so I, I'm just gonna continue doing these stories for myself. Um, and I may collect them later in Kickstarter or through another company, I'm not sure. Um, but right now, these are just for me. Uh, through my newsletter. Um, if you pay a buck, you get like a large size version of these on my Patreon page. Um, and I'm just doing these purely for the love. I love this world and characters and I'm, I don't want to sweat. You know, can I sell it? How many issues can I sell before, um, before cancellation? You know, and then does that mean nobody wants the book after it's been canceled? And, you know, um, and of course, those are our worst case scenarios. You know, you want your, you want to think your book is going to be successful when it comes out, but you just can't count on these things anymore. Especially with the market is very, very crowded, and it, it's nicely crowded with a lot of great books. So it just makes it hard to get seen and to be seen. Um, so instead of fighting with all of that and worrying about, well, will a market hurt my book because it only makes it so many issues or something, this is something I want to continue to do. So 
I'm just taking that risk out of the equation and just deciding to just do it myself. I mean, probably Kickstart is just the easiest way to do. Just continue. Um, although I wouldn't do it the way I've been doing it. So the way I've been doing this on Kickstarter is I did them as individual issues. Large issues, but individual issues. And I just don't think Kickstarter is really <clears throat> built for that for comics. I think Kickstarter comics need to be graphic novels or one-shots. I, I think some people are good at doing individual issues, but they usually sort of solicit them at, at once. You know, like a Kickstarter will be like issues one through three of such and such. Um, there's also just a question of how much work. Like, even on the production end, um, I love writing and drawing this, but like it comes to designing stuff and putting the book together, I need a lot of help. Um, so it's a little battly. But um, there you go. So that's the only reason why I don't just continue with Kickstarters. It's just there's a lot of work outside of just making the comic, you know. Perhaps when I first did After Realm, I if I just stuck to the format <laughs> that is basically advised or prescribed, I don't know what the phrase would be. For Kickstarter books, um, I would have just done it as a graphic novel, and it would be um, easier. But I kind of wanted to have my monthly book come out, or quarterly book come out, and I tried soliciting it through um, through Image as well as Kickstarter at the same time. Not realizing how confusing that was for retailers and readers and stuff, and uh, I think it caused some issues. So. Um, eventually just became a Kickstarter book. And again, I love doing my Kickstarter books. It's just work. A lot of work. A lot of external work, you know, like I said. Work that isn't just <coughs> drawing the book. So she's so actually yeah let me walk you through what's going on in this page although it's all backwards now yeah I'll wait till I turn it back around and I'll walk you through it boy it's one of those days though man I'm feeling like ickier as the day goes by. And it's weird, sometimes I do this layer to tighten things up, and when I'm working digitally, for some reason, it gets so loose, it's almost not worth me doing. Um, it's one of the reasons why I like going over it in pen. Um, when I go over it in pen, and the, all these lines are just much more short and stuff, and there's something about my pen, even though it's a, just a ballpoint pen, or, or maybe a, a pigment micron, just digging into the page um, I don't know I just I just feel it more um, and it, it does turn out better although sometimes before I start working on it then it just feels redundant you know I'm like well I'm just going over these lines and most of them I, I see in my head I could go into ink directly into ink for 85 percent of this um, so then I'm always doing math in my head for proficiency. What is the, like without losing quality, what is the fastest way I can do something? Um, I try to be as pragmatic as possible. Um, one day I'd like to just feel like I can take all the time in the world on something. But I don't know if that'll ever happen for me. <laughs> One of the main reasons was uh, my whole sort of indoctrination in the comics was 
speed working fast so that I can get samples together, get the samples out to editors, working fast once I got assignments so that I could turn it around and meet my deadlines and impress the editors so that I get more work, working fast so that I can have more than one book going on at once so that I can make a living and stay relevant. Uh, and this is even early on, not, not just now as I'm older. Um, so it's just, it's a lifelong habit, basically, my speed is difficult to break out of. So even if I had all the time in the world, it would be really difficult for me to act like it. <laughs> I mean, I guess ultimately what would happen is I would still work the same way I am, but instead of questioning myself, well, should I go over these layouts with my ballpoint pen and my Pigma Micron? Um, I just wouldn't think about the time that, that might the extra time that might take, and I would just do it. And I'd still move fast in my own way and all of that. I think it's good enough. Flip over now. So, let me actually explain what's going on in this page. Uh, well, let me try this first. I'm just trying to darken up the pencils a little bit. Okay. okay, so first panel here, we get an established shot of our museum. Then this sort of hole in the, the door in the sky starts to sort of appear. And we'll see this is the interior of the museum. Maybe we have like a word exhibit back here or something. Um, and this this door will appear on something. I'm not sure if it'll be just a part of the wall or maybe it's an object within the museum or something. I'll, I'll sort of work that out as I get closer and I can zoom in and just figure out my space and details and composition. And they step out of this door into the museum itself. You can see back here there's some stairs that she's going to walk up later and there's museum objects around, mostly Egyptian in this beginning section. Um, and now as Una is looking around, um, Puka is in the background and he finds some uh, vending machines and he's excited because there's like candy and chips and crap in there. Um, Una sits down with her maps and she rolls them out as he's breaking into the machine back here into the um, getting some chips and soda which he's got an arm full of chips and he cracks open the soda. Meanwhile Una you see her maps are over here, but then she sees this other set of maps. I thought it would be interesting that because she's a map maker and cartographer, that when she's in a museum, she finds one of those maps of the museum, you know, kind of shows the floor and everything, and that she would find that interesting. So she picks up one of these maps. And then the next couple pages is her moving on from there, and that, that pulls, her deep, pulls her deeper into the story. So that's basically what's going on here. Um, I also wanted to show, I think I mentioned earlier, that I wanted to have her in different outfits. Um, just to show that she's been traveling and there's been events since the last story. Um, uh, and I wanted to have a New York, and I love New York shirt on. Uh, I was just trying to think of something that didn't look like she was wearing something modern and funky and weird t-shirt on her. Uh, fantasy clothing for no reason other than to be cool. Like I wanted to, to say something, you know, either she's passed through New York or this is New York. 
um, what's left of New York. Um, is the after realm is basically a reversal of mythology. Um, so it happens after the apocalypse or the Ragnarok in, in her case, and she's rediscovering and remapping what's left of the world. Um, and while some of the stories will be retelling in mythology stories, a lot of them are going to be a mythological character, i.e. Una, um, really investigating what's left of our world um, and making comments not on mythology, but more on modern times through a mythological eye, trying to understand capitalism or um, fads or what phones were, all that kind of stuff. And eventually, like this story, Sometimes, yeah, it'll be pretty pretty steeped in actual mythology. So this is a revisiting, ultimately a revisiting of the Medusa story. All right. So I think I'm ready now. Actually, I think in the future I'm just going to do these overlays in a, like a hue of color. If I did that, yeah. It's too distracting. I have to lighten this up because I'm going to ink on top of it. Eh, that's good enough. Right, I'm going to lock down my ink layer, or my, it's not an ink layer, um, the panels, <laughs> so I don't draw on top of the wrong layer. Um, there's a bunch of different tricks I could do. I should probably actually combine all of these, these layers into one layer. In fact, I think that's what I'll do. I bumped up a little bit. All right. Now, I don't need to be precious about this stuff, so I don't need all these different layers. Um, it's not like I'm going to move them around or whatever. Whatever changes I got to do will, will be easy enough. Like I see right now, her head it looks too big, even for me. I draw big heads on people because I have a big head. Um, anyway, let's a little bit of passy on everything again, and, and let's have some fun. Let's get right into the inking. I think I'm just going to ink a little bit because, as I said, I'm feeling icky. But nothing makes me feel better than drawing, so you know I'm feeling sick, a little dizzy. This, uh, this makes me happy. I'm trying to stick with... I used to use like a, a brush size because I'm using the same template paper so that means every time I ink all my line work is pretty consistent and um, I was using a smaller brush like a 20 and I decided to try and stick closer to um, a 30, 40, or 50 size um, brush that I'm using. Um, and one of the reasons for that is I'm trying to emulate when I'm working digitally I'm, I'm trying to emulate myself analog so I want these pages to feel as close to the way I would ink this with a brush and pen as possible Um, and that means using slightly thicker lines because when you're working digitally you can just get so thin and, and fine that um, for me and the way that I draw and the way people are familiar with my line work you can kind of tell like you look at um, when I did World of Krypton now I purposely wasn't attempting to make my work look analog there um, I was purposely just leaning into a very digital, well for me, a very digital look. Um, After Realm I want it to feel uh, pretty organic. And even though this story I, I've decided because I'm working like this digitally, I'm also going to have a bit more of a cartoony feel to some of it. But I think really only on a level that I, I can detect. Um, I talk to my friends about this a lot. I, I feel like I have wildly different styles sometimes. And they're like, no, Mike. <laughs> no. You don't. <laughs> um, but 
but in my mind, these differences are huge. They're titanic shifts in like how thick the line work is, um, how rounded the faces are versus doing a lot of little shapes and stuff. Um, So to me, these are big differences, but they, they just might not mean anything to anybody else. I don't know. And even with the faces here, I'm typically using a smaller brush, but I'm just going with the flow right now. I've got this brush in hand, so even though it's digital, I'm not going to switch. It's a weird habit of half. I also have a weird habit of having my hand in my pocket, my left hand, instead of on the keyboard where I can be doing all the shortcuts, and then I just go up here and I use that instead. It's some sort of weird psychological block. I don't know, sometimes I'm using the keyboard shortcuts and sometimes I'm not. That would make it much easier to change the brush sizes so that when I'm doing a face, I'm using like a size 20 instead of a size 40. But you can't always explain behavior or why you do certain things, you know. And there's certain details on our faces I got to double check. Um, but I'm not going to right now because I want to move forward. So let's just move forward. Again, a nice thing about working digitally. It's, you can you can just lay shit down and you can come back to it later and and, and touch up. And like there's some sort of squiggly thing I put on his face here, and I just don't quite remember what it is that I do. So I'm just gonna leave it. It's, it's been a while since I drew these characters. Um, Well, it just feels like it's been a while because, um, as I said, I've been sick for basically a month straight. Um, so even if it wasn't that long ago that I was working on these guys, it feels like it. And I'm trying to subconsciously think about all of these lines that I'm using my Kurataki brush pen, or um, a Pigma Micro number one, or a Bemoji pen. And I'm, I'm trying to trick my brain into thinking those are the tips that I'm working with, not this digital pen here, which is how, I'm, or why I'm getting flat line here and a, and a flat line there, because it would be easy, so easy, to make every single line look like this, like just sharp on both ends and just overly smooth and stuff. But that's, to me, that starts to feel artificial. And I want this to feel as just real as possible. Real? That's the wrong word. Um, natural. Organic. Um, she's also got a series of belts that go across here, but I'm just skipping that right now. See, I just want to get the basic shape of the character down first. And then I'll worry about the details after. With enough planning ahead of time, you can really make your page go easy for you. Set yourself up for success by having some idea of what you're doing beforehand. This is something I often fail at. But I strive for it, you know? You know, maybe not doing, I should have done these figures, figure work with my <coughs> pen. <coughs> Pardon me. <coughs> um, and that might have set me up for success even better. But I was feeling impatient. I wanted to record something today, and I only had so much time, and all of that. So I was like, "All right, so just dump it, jump into the deep end of this."
Not a perfect hand, but I'm not worried about perfection. It's funny, a lot of times when I hate something, or I hate something, that's the wrong, strong word. Um, I dislike something that I draw, and I'm like, oh, I'll go back and fix that later. Often, once it's in the context of the drawing around it, it's fine. Um, and then there's other things that I just don't see until print, and I'm like, that's horrible. <laughs> Although that's more rare. Uh, more commonly is I'll see something that doesn't work. Like there's some weird tangent I think it's happening here. The way her arm is coming up against her breast and it just looks funky. But I'm going to, mm, I'll fix it later. Um, but typically I'll see this stuff. I'll see what doesn't work on something. Um, and just as I'm building the page or I put it down for an hour and come back to it after dinner or lunch. All right, I'm going to make this brush a little smaller now. Just make sure she's got a bit of a smile here, a little bit of venture. Like I said, store gets a little darker later. Not like powder's dark or anything. <laughs> Just gets a little darker later, so like I want it to be a little more levity at the beginning. Um, and that, that's something that kind of goes into the writing, which I should do a video about sometime. Um, we think about like the value charge of your scenes and your story. A value charge is like, does it start out funny and end sad? Um, like having an opposite charge for your, your scene, uh, an emotional charge usually works. It's not a rule that you have to have every single time. But um, if the scene starts funny, have it end sad. Start sad, have it end, I don't know, hopeful or confusing. or Well, confusing is probably not a good way. But um, have an opposite charge, have an opposite feeling. Because if, if a scene feels happy at the beginning, then happy at the end, no sense of irony or anything like that. Um, there's no, it contrasts is everything, whether it's in art or story, characters, contrast, contrast, contrast. Um, so, story ends kind of on a downer, sort of. Um, so, I want the beginning of it to feel a little more lighthearted. I guess I've got Puka. And then sugar busting into the vending machine. I'm just gonna have a little smile here, decent attitude, and it gets uh, a little more of a downer near the end. I'm not crazy about her face; it's a good face, it just doesn't exactly look like Una. But um, again, I don't stop and sweat the details. This does not mean I'm gonna leave it, or I'm just saying good enough, and you know. Um, I just believe in forward momentum. Go back and fix things afterwards. Sometimes you'll be surprised at what actually works and you just felt like it didn't. Um, definitely I know this does not work. I keep My eye keeps being drawn to this. It's just a bad tangent, which is this line going into this line and it just creates a third unnatural thing. It almost looks like her arm is in front of her breast or it's just weird, right? So I will fix that for sure. The face, we'll, we'll, we'll see. But anyway, look, I'm getting along pretty pretty good here. Make some headway. Just finding the shapes in her pant leg here. Gotta remember she's got these sort of boot things, so it's gonna flare out on this leg. She's stepping through the doorway. <clears throat>
going to be other details in here. Um, no, so let's do this. Let's rotate the canvas. lower that opacity. I'm going to create another thing here. Just got to figure out what to do with this arm. Yeah, I think this works better. Yeah, it's found a better shape for it. Sometimes reversing in a, uh, a drawing, you'll be able to just see better choices. Also, her breasts were just too high. Her chest was too high. I mean, her proportions are all fucked up because the way I draw, but that's okay. I draw abstractly and cartoonishly, and I, and I work with it. But sometimes it just doesn't work, you know? It's a uh, art is in the eye, the polar kind of situation. Um, Something that'll work for me won't work for others, and vice versa. And the more I like, look at it, the more I'm fine with this face. Although I think some hair should be falling behind her or something here. All right, so let's rotate canvas again. And I started to draw this sort of like armor that she wears underneath here, but she's wearing a t-shirt. So let me not forget, she's wearing a t-shirt. That means here. <sighs> yeah. She's got a little t-shirt collar thing. <laughs> I hope this look works. I'm not sure. This is the first time I'm going this far with the, her character being like just wearing this amalgam of modern and fantasy clothes. It might be horrible. It's funny, it's one of the um, fantasy tropes I love to do but hate to see which is the mixture of, of modern and um, the modern things in, in fantasy, you know. Um, like I hated that He-Man when I was a kid. The movie He-Man was half in the real world. You know, and, um, and I've seen that kind of thing done a lot, both in comics and, and elsewhere, and it's something I wanted to avoid in this book, but I ended up going there anyway. Um, so it's interesting. Um, I guess I have very specific opinions about it and how, how it's done. Um, and maybe arrogantly, like I'm, I'm only liking the way I go about it. Um, I don't know. It's, it's interesting though. Um, I especially hate in fantasy when I see, um, I mean, this is different than mixing fantasy and uh, narratively. Um, I, I hate when I see like, these hairstyles and stuff that are so modern or makeup that's completely modern in what's supposed to be like a high fantasy situation. You know, the, the characters sometimes look like they just step out of Sephora. And that doesn't take me away to a different place. It doesn't take me away to another world when I see that. And it's like a constant wink and a nod. Oh, this isn't, you're not really here. You're not really in this other place. You're really at home on a couch 
watching something. It's sort of a happy ground, a medium between those two things, you know. But a lot of times it's just, I don't know, just done poorly. For my taste. For my taste. Maybe people really like that because they don't need fantasy the same reasons that I need fantasy. I need fantasy to um, escape. That's why I like it. All right, let's uh, let's take a little bit of a look here. <coughs> and I might have to call it in a little bit because I'm feeling goopy. Damn it! There we go. Sometimes it's fun. Once I've so these are the these are the these are the shadows that I intended to fill here. All this stuff. This is all stuff that I wanted to do. And then it's really fun sometimes to just drop in. Yeah, that's too much. That kind of works. That's pretty cool. Actually, I think I might even keep that. Oh, it'll look like that was all black or. That's pretty cool. I like that. I think I'll keep it. Um, or even go really far. In its own way, that would really work. Um, but this is an establishing shot of the interior, so I need to be able to see everything. But anyway, here we are. We're off to a start. Um, I'm just thinking here. Okay, uh, I'm going to create another layer. Just pump this opacity down a little bit on the main eggs. And I'm going to get into our cape, which I forgot to draw here. So that this is good. So I have her cape. I did a sketch, a very loose sketch of this um, cape situation, her harness and everything, um, on the on the script, <laughs> like as I was laying out the the script, I was uh, just did a very light sketch of what her new outfit would look like. Um, I'm a I have a very, very strong visual imagination, which makes sense. I'm a comic book artist, right? Um, but it's very strong um, to the extent I almost never, ever, I rarely design anything in my sketchbooks. I almost always design things as I'm drawing them, um, mostly because I already have such a strong preconceived idea in my head of what I want it to be. Um, and then, you know, I, I very rarely regret it. Um, Sometimes, yeah, I'll go in ahead of time with a with a strong plan of designing certain things. Usually, even then, it's just one or two sketches, and then I make a choice and move on. Um, but when I worked at Valve, I worked at Valve, a video game company. We did a bunch of comics there that were great, great fun to work on. Um, one of the best things I learned there was iteration which is how many versions of a design can you do so that you work out your best and worst ideas and really push your good ideas. Um, 
so I find a lot of value in that. It's just that I, I just don't always do it for various reasons. Um, I mean, usually time. And also if I'm working on a creator-owned thing, I kind of already see it all in my head. And I've talked before about how that can be a detriment as well, uh, mostly in just my day-to-day -day life, because I'll see something in my head that I did not do in reality. <laughs> and I think I did this thing because I saw it in my head. I lost my car like that once because in my mind's eye, I clearly painted a picture of a different place that it was and, and it wasn't there. Um, but my mind's eye created this image and I was like, I parked near this highway thing and couldn't find the fucking car. <laughs> it's like 45 minutes of walking around. I was so frustrated. Um, spell checking is really hard for me. First of all, I'm a bad speller. Secondly, my mind fills in the words that I'm supposed to see on my script when I'm rereading it. So often I have to listen to it uh, through some sort of program as I'm reading it to myself. And then I can see or hear the words that I actually wrote as opposed to what I see in my head. Um, so in some ways, being a super visual person is a great advantage. And other times, not so much. I'm not so happy with some lines here, but I think it'll get cleared up as I'm um, coloring or as I'm just finishing up. Yeah, I'm going slow too, man. Like for me, so this has been about an hour, and uh, this is all I've got done. Cause I, hey, I'm just, I'm just not feeling great. Um, I'm trying to think what's next. I guess I should finish the door up so that it'll make doing the background and everything easier. Create another layer. I'm going to make grab the circle tool here and make sure that the aspect ratio is off. Oops. And I'm just gonna kind of guesstimate the size of this hole that they're stepping through. Let's say it's that. Outline. And keep this outline really small because I'm going to just ink right on top of it. And I'm going to grab it and put it at the angle that I want them stepping out of. So right around there. There we go. Um, now there's. This door that comes out of a hole, I want it to be about the same size. So I'm going to duplicate that layer. Oops. Um, but when she's opening it here, I, I still want it to be at a slightly different angle. So I'm going to do this transform. Free transform makes it malleable, so I can just kind of change. So it's a slightly different size. Now I'm going to combine those two layers together. Oops. Here's the magic door. Um, I'm going to keep this super simple right now because, well, as I keep saying, I don't feel great. And I'm going to work out the details later. So it's going to be these boards that come through. See, I'm just drawing it right on top of this other layer, so I don't have to fight too much with, you know, where everything's lined up.
There we go. There's going to be a doorknob over here, but I'm not going to worry about that right now. Let's just knock out the lines behind her. I could just select this whole area and delete it, but uh, yeah, let me just show you what I mean. Except it's going to delete over here. Crap. All right, never mind. Uh, see the cape is going in here, so actually now that I've done that, never mind, never mind. Basically, I could have just selected the inside of her body here as well, but I think it would have taken just as much time to select the inside of her and then delete it as it would to just do this because of all the different little shapes and stuff. I did not express that well, I'm sorry. I'm just tired and not feeling great. <laughs> all right, it looks like I'm going to get rid of all the lines. And this, this line's going to be glowing and stuff because it's magic, magical. Yeah, I'm going to have to work this little clay a little bit. I'm also not crazy about some of the, the line work here because of the, the quality of the digital brush that I'm using. Well, not the digital brush. It's it's. I think I have a very old Cintiq. So, um, in some ways, I like that the lines are look the way that they do, and then other times I hate the way that they look. Um, but again, most of that is is on such a subliminal level. Only I'm really gonna see it. I do have to draw her leg back here. There's something's looking funky here between her legs, and like create another layer. Let's just draw how her leg would look. It's going to be weird because it's behind him. But I think just seeing a little bit here will be enough. And I just got to put some weight to her cape here. And think about the other. Oh, look at that. I missed the line. Went right through her face. Ah, oh, well, I'll fix it. Let's get in here and fix his face real quick. Like, I mean, you can barely tell it's coming through her face here, but I can tell. Some that's going to, it's going to take some adjusting once I fill in the black here. It keeps uh, telling myself I'm going to call it quits. <laughs> Go rest up or something, but I like drawing, man. I like inking. 
I like making stuff. I feel so bipolar when I'm working digitally. Like in some ways I'm so happy with it, and other times I'm like, oh, I just wish this was all like pen, pen and brush. <clears throat> what we got? Yeah, I'll have to rework that section a little bit. There's quite a bit, a little bit of uh, touch-ups I'm going to do. I can't believe how much time I'm spending on this right now. <laughs> Alright, we're getting there. Yeah, I'm just shocked at how long this is taking. That. Little details like this will help too. Just these little little lines. All right, I think we're done right now. I uh, will come back with more later. Um, like I said, I'll try and record as much of this stuff as I can. Um, it all sort of depends on where I am in the house and while I'm doing stuff. I just can't record everything all the time, especially because I'm going to send this over to my iPad and I'll work some on my iPad and maybe I'll be able to record some of that, maybe not. Um, also, it was difficult splitting my attention while I'm not feeling well. And uh, yeah, anyway, <clears throat> I'm going to try and record as much of this and share as much of this with you guys as possible. And if you have questions, please post them below. Um, I'm pretty sure I'll see you guys on the rest of this before New Year's, but in case not, Happy New Year. And uh, 
All right. We will see you guys um, a little bit later. Thanks for hanging out.